Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about high performance teams. Um, Cliff's gone through the training, and actually, a lot of what I'm going to talk about overlaps a lot with Cliff, and I actually think. Um, we have a lot of overlap in QI or research, training, how we actually work. I think they're all interchangeable. This is one of our registrars who I think a week after her training is doing an intubated stretcher winch on the side of a cliff uh, with waves crashing in. And uh, you can see she's looking for that helicopter. She wants to get, <laughs> get off the rock. It used to be here. Yeah. <laughs> so, before I go in and talk about high performance teams, um, I think all of us are in the game of critical care and saving people's lives. And in many ways, uh, the opponent or enemy we face is the death or dying process or having a patient with long-term disability. And I really believe strongly that we need to do as best we can for these patients to make sure we save them, number one, but number two, that we leave them with a good outcome. And in many ways, our challenge is to stop that dying process. And you may not be able to see this that clearly, um, but in some ways, we're like Boba Fett. We're like the bounty hunter who, in Empire Strikes Back, said, he's no good to me dead. And that's the way we kind of have to think of ourselves in some way. If you're not a Star Wars fan, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that's just the way it is. But what we are trying to do is change the probability or likelihood that the patient is going to die. And everything we trained for is to deflect that trajectory towards death. That can be in intensive care with a crashing patient, it can be on the side of the road, it can be in a small hospital with a critically ill patient. We're trying to perform meaningful life-saving interventions quickly and as efficiently as possible. And more importantly, make critical decision-making, uh, make critical decision, uh, decisions under pressure so as to deflect the patient off this. So yes, we have a lot of challenges, but actually I look at the challenges that we face as a good thing. Um, challenges can drive high performance. Challenges can drive innovation. And innovation is rarely preceded by uh, perfection. Um, but both innovating and making or constructing high performance teams leads to excellence, and that's what it's all about. We're trying to achieve excellence. None of us are trying to achieve a low standard. We want excellence. And if I go back to the origins of high performance or marginal gains theory, where you're trying to make a little improvement to have a long-lasting effect, you actually don't need to look much further than this guy called uh, Steinitz and his accumulation theory. Now, this guy was the first world champion in chess in 1886, and he really annoyed the hell out of the other chess players because he analyzed them. And you can see this chess player beside him. That's Steinitz on the right. The guy on the left is thoroughly hacked off that this guy is beating him. But what he would do is he would, he would analyze his opponent or challenger. He would actually do research on that opponent or challenger. And he would understand their strengths and weaknesses and use all of that to gain the advantage over that uh, opponent, and finally dominate him. And if you think about it, in critical care or pre-hospital care, we should apply the same attitude towards the dying process or severe shock or trauma or whatever it is. And today, the exemplar of this is the Formula One realm and the marginal gains that they try to achieve in that area. So in Formula One, they have very strict regulations. They've got very tight window they're allowed to work in. And they've got very specific uh, engine size and chassis type they're allowed to use. But they try their best to eke out as small improvement as they can to, to beat their opponent. And I believe in pre-hospital care, the constraints that we have, such as the austere environment, uh, the bad weather, the cold weather, the sun, all of those things actually are a good thing in some ways. They actually drive us to change and innovate. You will all be aware of Dave Brailsford, who took on the British Cycling Olympic team and was very success, successful with them and the British Sky team. And he basically broke everything down that went into cycling a bike, everything, like every single component. And he tried to achieve a 1% or a small gain in every single aspect of cycling. Um, that would lead to a, high, uh, a significant improvement over time and eventually lead to what's called a high-performance organization, which is what they are. And if you look at this 
vision of these cyclists. They all look the same. They're all doing the same. They're all on the same type of bike. They've all kind of tried to achieve as best they can. And that guy in the middle with the 1% is the Tour de France champion. But you can't tell by looking at them because they're just all trained in the same way. So we should have the same approach in pre-hospital care or critical care. Interestingly, over time, if you achieve marginal gains, you will improve. But if you don't, and if you sit static, I'm not even talking about marginal decline, but if you actually don't improve all the time, you will decline. And we always have to question ourselves as to what kind of organization are we working in? Are we working in a high performance organization that subscribes to marginal gains? Or are we working in one that remains static? But it doesn't remain static, it actually declines. So this comes on to the concept of operational research. And this is actually a World War II military concept where instead of mindlessly just blowing things up or trying to kill people, they actually applied some research to try and use essentially application of analytical methods into making better decisions. And in many ways in what we do, we apply operational research. Now when we think of research, this is how we traditionally view research. Some of us are very sick of the fact that we've never done a meta-analysis and we've never done systematic reviews. I haven't done a randomized controlled trial. You're made to feel very bad because you haven't done these top of the pyramid type events. Um, but that's not operational research. It's not the day-to-day -day of how you run your theater for an ethicist or how you run your intensive care or how you work a pre-hospital system. So I have changed this uh, process into, uh, this is how I view things. And we'll start at the top and work our way down. Okay, so we start to, we'll talk about collecting data reliably. That seems simple, but it's not done well by a lot of organizations, be it hospital-based or pre-hospital-based. Then we'll talk about measurement of clinical KPIs. Do you have clinical KPIs in your hospital or in your pre-hospital service? And then we'll talk about audit of the system, the process, the outcome, and then finally you get onto some kind of research, like asking a retrospective question, then asking a prospective question, and then you kind of get onto the holy grail of uh, performing an RCT, then you do another RCT, and I'll come onto the pointy end a little bit later. <laughs> but it's not really the pointy end. Okay, so collecting data reliably. I think it's fair to say a lot of HEMS services and EMS services have been guilty of not collecting data reliably. You've all been in the resuscitation room and looked at the scribble that comes in from the pre-hospital arena and go, what happened here? What's been going on? Um, so we're really now focused on collecting the data reliably. You can't measure what you don't collect. So every time we do a mission, we have a written case sheet, but the doctor has to enter it into this uh, electronic database that you see here called Air Maestro. And this is consistent across all the bases in New South Wales. And it contains interesting areas that allow us to audit and to research what we do. It contains an airway registry for every single intubation, and it contains an ultrasound registry, and uh, essentially allows us to collect all that, those data. And the airway registry, we even uh, we do video laryngoscopy and record the, the actual airway intubation and put it up onto this uh, data record here. Then we have clinical KPIs. I'd be interested to see how many of you have those embedded in your system. An example of some of our clinical KPIs are our first pass success rate in pre-hospital anesthesia. We know that if we have more than one attempt, they're, likely, they're more likely to desaturate, they're more likely to become hypotensive, and that's very bad for a traumatic brain injury patient. Uh, we have a arrival to intubation time in a patient who should be intubated, who's not trapped of less than 15 minutes. How many of your trauma centers from arrival of a patient will get a tube into a patient before they go to theater or to the CT scanner in under 15 minutes? A place like Royal London, which is one of the big trauma centers in Europe, would have a KPI of less than 10 minutes. And we have end tidal CO2 parameters that we stick to in intubated trauma patients, uh, particularly head injury patients. And KPIs drive innovation. So what we found was that one of the, in, and again, fitting with the marginal gains theory, we're trying to maximize the speed of doing this intubation. And if the rappel course over the last few days was quite interesting where uh, one of the sticking or one of the, the points where there was protraction was people drawing up drugs. 
So you know you're going to intubate this person, or it's likely you're going to intubate someone today. Um, so what we do is actually have a pre-drawn drugs. The drugs are already drawn up, and they're in our pouch, thigh pouch, and we don't have to draw them up on the scene. There's nothing worse than picking up a glass ampule when you're adrenalized and see it go up like this in the air and, and go up like that and go smash on the ground. Okay, when I mention the word audit, there's usually a collective groan, uh, but I actually see audit as sexy and cool, believe it or not. Um, but we do need to audit how we do things. So for instance, in a hypovolemic shock patient, did our doctor give the th all three units of red blood cells that we carry? And if not, why not? Or, the corollary is the case as well, did a doctor give a not so bad trauma patient one unit of blood and expose that patient to the side effects of having a single unit of blood? So you kind of look at it in two different ways. So in many ways, I actually would call it pressure testing the system. We need to really look at how we do it and why we do it. This is Kareem Broey, who many of you will know is uh, a very humble uh, trauma surgeon from uh, London. And he tweeted this recently. And this comes back to retrospective audit. And he wrote, I just realized that it's 15 years since I published the acute traumatic coagulopathy article. And he was the first to really describe this concept of a specific coagulopathy relating to trauma. And he says, I'm still amazed by how much this has changed what we do and how many lives have been saved since we started prioritizing hemostasis over perfusion. It's one of the most highly cited trauma patients in the last 30 years. So this one paper has nearly 1,400 citations, massive amount of citations in any, for a journal article. But this is the most important tweet that he said in this. He said, it's also good to remember that this was an unfunded retrospective review of existing data carried out by a junior doctor doing a full clinical job on London HEMS. So that paper came out of just a pure audit process by a junior doctor just doing a rotation through London HEMS. So we have looked at this ourselves. We are a pre-hospital and adult, uh, essentially mainly an adult retrieval service, but we do go to pre-hospital pediatric trauma. But it's fair to say a lot of us don't see pediatric trauma day in, day out. So we decided to describe our pre-hospital pediatric intubation success rate, what our first pass success rate and how we did. And we actually found, interestingly, that we had among the highest first pass success rate in the world reported, and we, so we did an audit um, and published this. And this actually was quite interesting. The Cincinnati Kids Hospital, which is one of the top hospitals in the States for kids, wrote an editorial on this. And they wrote, collectively, the GSA HEMS approach to standardization of process represents an attention to detail that has likely elevated their performance despite the relative, relative infrequency. So we see these things infrequently, but we train for it uh, so that we don't get it wrong. It offers a roadmap to optimizing performance and safety, especially for pediatric specific environments with infrequent exposure to high risk emergency procedures. Interestingly, when you look at tertiary pediatric EDs and their uh, you know, first pass success rate or their hypoxia or hypotension rate, they are far worse than this. So how do we, in a pre-hospital arena, achieve higher first-pass success rates in children than a tertiary ED. And it comes down to the culture and the training. And what we tend to do, say, for instance, regarding airway, is standardize things as best we can. We provide education and training. Cliff's already talked a lot about that. And we use cognitive aids. So we will use an airway checklist, and we'll use a pediatric cheat sheet or reference cards. So if I know I'm flying to a four-year-old with severe head trauma, I'm already doing a zero-point survey, which includes turning the card over to age four. And that's, me, that's the drug doses, the tube size, the depth of insertion, all out of the way. And now I'm thinking more about other aspects. And then governance. We have strict governance in terms of M&M uh, &M and review. Then we did a prospective study. So there's a lot of talk about using ketamine in RSI of patients. And so we decided to look at that, and again, publish that, and 
looked at shocked patients and not so shocked patients, and there's a lot of discussion around this area now. And then finally, we've got on towards the pointy end in doing a prospective trial. So we have finally evolved into being able to do a prospective trial. And some of you may have heard of this trial. It's been run in Australia, and it's a randomized controlled trial on TXA versus placebo in trauma. Uh, so this is going on as we speak. So the pointy bits at the end, we're going to ignore those. So they, they are renal physiology. I have no idea how, about renal physiology or how it works. Uh, how to find a unicorn. I don't know how to do that either. And for uh, Star Trek nerds, the Q continuum, how Q, the whole Q continuum works, I'm not so sure either. So I kind of ignore that section. But let's come back to the top and go back to collecting data reliably and reporting and performing that operations research. So now we've got this information, besides publish, publishing articles and research, what do we do with this corporate knowledge that we have developed? Do you keep it in your own service? And a lot of services do tend to keep the data to themselves, but we don't have that ethos. We train other services, and we feel strongly that we should share our findings and what we've learned with other, other services. So we do prefer to see ourselves as having a ripple effect on other areas. So here you can see, this is one of our senior paramedics, and he is giving a lecture to some junior paramedics about why helicopters are called, or why you should call one, or when. Uh, and he's talking around patient access, sometimes they're up the side of a cliff, that's an obvious one. Um, if it's far from a trauma center, and essentially uses a fast vehicle, that's another one. Or if there's a clinical need. So he's actually educating as to why you would call one. And here's one of our doctors here, Jeff Healy, again, lecturing junior paramedics on the physiology of dying. We, are, we, we see a lot of physiologically altered patients, and it's only right that we share that with the rest of the ambulance service. We also have a research program for our registrars and also for medical students. We believe strongly that anyone who shows an interest in coming to our service should be treated the same way. So we do not look down on medical students. Medical students have done some excellent research with us. And this is Floris Oud, and he's a medical student in uh, the Netherlands who's now doing anesthesia training. And he came to do research with us and just published a paper with us a week ago on feasibility of TEG in a helicopter. We've also expanded out of the aeromedical world and into the university. So myself and Cliff run two modules around the retrieval or aeromedical environment for Sydney University Masters in Critical Care students. Now, some of these students are, uh, who are doctors will never go on to become retrieval specialists, but it does teach them a different mindset. <coughs> it teaches them to perform these procedures under pressure or, more importantly, critical decision-making under pressure. Uh, and a lot of them tell us that's the reason they're doing these modules. And as Cliff has already mentioned, our, the training that we do goes beyond our own service and into other services. And yes, it's onerous, it's time consuming, but it's very worthwhile. We do get a lot out of it. But not just within face-to-face -face kind of sharing of knowledge and, and operational research, we also share information online. And if you go to uh, the Sydney Hems website, we have one of our doctors, uh, her mission is to review all the airways that we do in fine detail. And she'll, if you don't write enough detail, she'll email you and say, can you give me more detail? And the really good learning points she will share online uh, with the world. So you can go and look at some very interesting airway cases at, on the Sydney Hems website. We also have a blog and we often discuss things that were discussed at our clinical governance day, they're obviously de-identified, but we, we do believe in sharing this information. But core to the culture of excellence are, is, is surrounding ourselves by colleagues that are on the same trajectory. So we all have different skills and different abilities, but it's fair to say, and I've talked to Cliff about this many times, we have a, a, a group of paramedics and specialists who work in our uh, service that are on a very similar trajectory. We see a similar process. We, we all want to get better. Um, and that's, that's quite unique. It's actually quite hard to build, um, but we certainly have that. Now, you can build that if you put enough emphasis on constantly improving. Often, the people who are not interested in improving will leave. So I don't know if you've experienced that in your own departments. Usually, they'll leave. 
the, the detractors will leave and you'll just build a better service. And in many ways, NASA embodies this culture. And that's really down to people. In the end of the day, building a good service or high performance organization is about people. It's not about a fancy building. It's not about the helicopter. It's about people. And this is Frank Borman. And he was described as someone who walks in a straight line. I love that description. In a straight line. So he was the captain of the Apollo 8, and he was just very task focused. Uh, he had no patience for shades of gray, but he, was dro he drove the system and was very committed. Now, the Apollo 8 mission was quite interesting because there was 5.9 million moving parts from in, in that rocket or in that, uh, the, the entire event and machinery that went on. So even if you engineered out 99.99% of the issues, there is going to be still quite a lot of potential failures. So their culture in NASA, they do train or accept that there will be error and failure, but they train for it and they emb embody or embed redundancy into that system. So you really have to identify the high risk areas for error and build in redundancy. So for us, that is winch operations, winch operations at night, uh, any night operations in a helicopter, or the RSI or intubation of a shocked trauma patient. How much attention to detail do you put into tubing a shocked trauma patient? I can't remember the last time we tubed a hypovolemic shocked patient and they arrested afterwards. We have very much attention to detail into those areas uh, to avoid those er errors. Uh, do you have backup capnography? If you're going to assume one will, will malfunction, do you have backup? And it comes back to the expeditionary type medicine that Cliff was referring to. Here's another example here. I'll just play this. It's on our emergency airway path. We can go to that on emergency sink at high pressure and mark. Check the patient. Is the chest moving bilaterally? It's going to put that up to 100% there, sorry. Is the chest moving bilaterally? Yes, it is. Okay. Ventilator alarms. So the alarms will go to peak. High pressure. All right. And our pressure alarm on the vent is currently P max is set at 38. He's a bigger patient, so we could potentially call that a little bit higher. We want the vent to go down to there. The monitor is the end time of CO2. Oh, we've got a bit of obstructive. So that's actually not in flight. That's the helicopter's in the hangar and we're creating the noise, and we have the other participants are watching in a room. And we're trying to, that's a bariatric uh, simulated patient, and we're simulating a high pressure alarm in flight. Often on the scene, it's actually easier to troubleshoot stuff. So we found that the, through our research, looking back at our service, that uh, desaturation or hypoxia or high pressure alarms in flight were quite vulnerable areas and areas for error. So to try and offload Again, ourselves, in terms of trying to troubleshoot in the back of a helicopter, we have these aid memoirs on the side of the ventilator. Now, a lot of you would think that's obvious. You know how to troubleshoot a high pressure alarm. But do you trust yourself enough under severe pressure to trust yourself? That's, that's one of the questions. So it comes down to we also have them for hypotension, high and tidal CO2, etc. One of the interesting areas, I think, of working in the environment we work in, there are skeptics out there. There are skeptics in the hospital uh, with respect to what we do in hospital. Now, all of us do work in the hospital, and some of our colleagues are quite skeptical uh, about some of the things that we do. But I do believe if you build a robust governance structure into your service and have data to support what you're doing, that's quite powerful. And that actually drives change. Traditionally, the hospitals informed EMS or HEM services how they should carry out their business. That has flipped on its head in Sydney. We now, through uh, looking at the system and looking at what we do and looking at what we need for the patient, have driven from the outside in. Um, and I'll give some examples of that, but the go before I do, I'll just talk about the governance. So Cliff touched on that. We do uh, clinical governance days every fortnight where we go through a lot of different uh, audits. Uh, we also look at all the new papers that come out. Uh, we might ask someone from another service to talk about a, a niche area. Uh, we audit our airways, our ultrasound use, and our blood use. But coming back to driving from the, the, the service or the system from the outside in, 
Obviously in Australia we've got very large or long flight times at times. So sometimes we'll fly from the equivalent of Copenhagen to London in a helicopter or from Edinburgh to Berlin, it's these crazy distances. We have these trauma patients in the back who are bleeding. We only carry three units of red blood cells uh, currently. Our, and so what we actually developed through the ambulance is a pre-hospital MTP. So we're, one of the, we're the first state in, in Australia to have a pre-hospital MTP. So based on coordination, as we're flying back towards a trauma center and we need to refuel or stop, or if the patient is trapped and they're clearly badly injured, the control center that tasks us will contact the local blood bank and products will get sent by the police to that patient. Um, so we have literally done about 30 or 40 massive transfusion cases pre-hospital, who I believe and our service believes would not have survived the journey to hospital without those products. Another aspect that we have developed is the code crimson. Um, and I'm not sure if you have this in Denmark, I'm sure you probably do, but that is where we have HEMS teams who can activate a part of the hospital that is required. So if I've got a shocked trauma patient who I've tubed, who's got a positive fast scan in the abdomen, they're bleeding in the abdomen, their blood pressure is 60 after three units of blood or whatever it is, I want a surgeon. I'm not going to land on, on the 10th floor of a trauma center and go down to the ED to go back up again to theater. So that took a long time to build in, but we have developed, they have, there's a trust in our system now that we can activate anesthetist surgeons to be ready in theater. And that has been quite successful in Sydney. And as Kareem Broy eloquently said, I'd rather be in the OR with the blood pressure of 60 and not know where the bleeding is than be in ED with the blood pressure of 20 and be sure. So many people don't get that. How many times have you seen a bleeding trauma patient remain in the ED until we get the blood pressure up? We need to get the blood pressure up. We need to get the blood pressure up. We are not stopping the bleeding. They have to get to theater. And lastly, I'll finish on the future of high performance. I do think we will be wearing wearable devices pre-hospital, not necessarily for coaching, uh, although that is a potential, or for intervention remotely, but mainly for debriefing or reviewing the case. We currently are relying on someone's own recording of their experience in that mission, or their own black box recording is another way you could put it. Um, but certainly it would be good to have wearable devices and be able to actually record the case for points of improvement. I think artificial intelligence uh, will assist critical care in the future, whether we like it or not, it's coming. And it's coming in a big way. So we actually have to engage in how that's going to help us in the future. I do think there'll be personalized resuscitation in the future, and that's not just in pre-hospital care, it's in acute emergency medicine, it'll be in critical care. We're going far more down towards a tailored approach to a patient rather than a, a blunderbuss. I think we will have less invasive treatments in the future. The days of doing thoracotomy to compress the aorta are over with Reboa, um, but there'll be more less invasive uh, things in the future. And no talk is complete without talking about suspended animation. So at some point we will have suspended animation. And I think I will leave it there. So that is it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them.